told you he was going to leave immediately after and head right out and get in the truck and move. Well, okay, that was exaggeration. But just to demonstrate it, he is now in a new setting. So you see that I was not making it up. And uh, thank you in spite of moving and being in a new place for being willing to give your time. It's excellent. Thank you very much. Glad to see you that you're alive. Um, so if I could see um, Brother... Well, uh, Brother Zamtan Lian, I don't know if you're, how things are looking for you today as far as your connection, but if you're there, um, if you're able to lead us in prayer in just a moment. And what I'll do here is just for those of you, all of us should have, uh, should, should remember Dr. Farapal, but I'll just give a brief introduction and then you can go back and look at the previous video. But he holds a PhD in um, worldview, apologetics and worldview, just graduated a couple of months ago from Southern, the Southern Seminary. And then at this point, he is in Connecticut, where he's just taken over a pastor there. So uh, we will remember you in our prayers as well for your survival and your adjustment, and uh, in spite of the time that you're giving us here, for which we're very grateful. Okay, um, I don't think I have anything else to say besides just make sure you keep up with the readings on the Moodle page. Um, I'm okay with us reading them after, though I, I want to, you know, I, I recognize within the first two weeks, New people are still coming in, so I'm not really strict about reading it before the lecture, but after this next lecture, so we're coming up on the end of two weeks now, I'll try to get us back on track that we can try to read before the lecture, because I think the, the discussions are more profitable, if, if possible, to read it before the lecture. Okay, Brother Zantan Lee, and if you can lead us in prayer, and then uh, Dr. Thorfall, the time is yours, and we'll continue from there. That's great. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Sounds good. I'm sorry. I think it vanished. Yes. Okay. We can hear you. Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, Father, we are so thankful that we can come together again for the study. So, Father, it is full with blessings to study apologetics. Not only that, Father, and we are going to learn so many things, so rich, plenty of materials, especially the challenge to the modern world. Father, and help us, Lord, and it's not only that we defend our faith, but also, Lord, and it's to be able to see what we believe and what we have in our hearts, which really fly into the real world. So, Father, and the we just want to thank you for all the professors and all the teachers and all the students and all the believers and all the students. Thank you so much and give us Lord a real blessing time as we study together in Jesus name we pray. Amen. 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 Mm. Sorry, I should unmute myself before I speak. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for your prayer. And Dr. Thrawfall, the time is yours. Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Arnold. Uh, very thrilled to be here again. Thank you, those of you who are tuning in and listening. Um, so our topic uh, this morning is religious epistemology. And just so you know how I intend to structure this time, we'll take um, five segments, okay? So the first four will be me uh, talking about epistemology. And then in the fifth segment, uh, Dr. Arnold and I will have a little back and forth uh, sometime near the end uh, so we can have some, some questions and answers. I find that personally stimulating and obviously Dr. Arnold has done a lot of thinking about this as well. And so, um, no, I'm serious about that. And so he, he can help, I think, clarify some of my thoughts on this uh, as, as we move forward. Um, but I guess I wanted to first of all answer the question, why are we talking about epistemology in a course on apologetics? And that is because epistemology as the theory of knowledge uh, is, a, is central to the task of apologetics because epistemology is the question of how do we know that we know? What grounds our knowledge? Uh, so if you are, um, you're sitting in front of your computer or you're looking at your phone, and if you start thinking really introspectively, you could start wondering, how do I know that I, I'm really doing this? How do I know that there's really a laptop in front of me? Uh, how do I know that I'm not dreaming right now? Uh, how do I know that um, uh, any number of propositions that you can think of, epistemology seeks to answer the question, how do we know that we know? And, and when it comes to the apologetics, 
uh, that several years ago when I was uh, entering the uh, apologetics program at Southern Seminary, for the, for the entrance examination, I, they asked me to write a history of uh, Christian apologetics. And as I was uh, preparing for that exam question, one thing that came to my mind is that even the history of apologetics itself hinges on this question, how do people arrive at conclusions? Uh, so if you're going to try to demonstrate the validity of the Christian faith, um, are, how, upon what grounds are you going to demonstrate? Are you going to say the Christian faith ought to be believed because it's rational? Or the Christian faith ought to be believed because there is sufficient evidence for it? Or the Christian faith ought to be believed because it's absurd? In fact, this is the idea of uh, Tertullian, uh, an early church father, who famously says, what does Athens have to do with Jerusalem? Athens being the center of, of secular philosophy at that time, and Jerusalem being a, a, you know, a metaphor for the Christian faith. In other words, what does secular philosophy have anything to do with our Christian faith? So they, in, they operate independently, and we should not try to validate our faith based on philosophical categories that already exist. Um, and he actually said, this may be a little bit of a caricature, and you have to understand the polemical context in which he was speaking, but Tertullian did say, uh, that the faith ought to be believed because it's absurd. In other words, it conflicts with my rational way of thinking, and therefore this must be indica indicative of transcendent truth that I ought to embrace. But again, what is he doing? He's operating on a, a certain epistemological uh, foundation. Uh, so the whole question of apologetics is a question of um, epistemology. Um, so, Can I pause and interject something? Yes. And your deck, I, I just thought it was fabulous when you mentioned history of uh, apologetics. How would we even establish that? We just finished last semester church history, and we spent at least two or three lectures talking about standards of historiography. How do I know that you know, Napoleon was even a guy? Um, and so we, we, we struggled through this. Well, so that's just a historic, a historical application of epistemology. Okay, I'm yeah. done. Yeah. No, th yeah, that's great. It's helpful to see the parallels in other disciplines as well. Um, and so throughout history, throughout especially the history of apologetics, and, and by that I mean at, at different periods of the, of the church, uh, leaders in the church had different approaches to commending the Christian faith, and those different approaches hinged upon a, an epistemological framework. Um, okay, so, so what I want to, having just introduced the relationship between epistemology and apologetics, uh, what I want to do now is kind of the first segment of this lecture is to give you several statements, and I want us to think through what does each statement reveal about the speaker's epistemology. Uh, I'm going to make a statement, and, and, and you ask, um, according to this statement, what does this reveal about the speaker's condition, uh, what the speaker believes satisfies the conditions for belief? All right, so here's, here's the first statement. I believe God is real because I can feel his presence when I pray. So let's think through that. I believe that God is real because I can feel his presence when I pray. Let's evaluate that epistemologically. What is the epistemic basis upon which that person uh, understands the belief in God to be justified? And that is the, a sense of feeling, an awareness of the presence of God. Um, uh, so that would be an epistemology of religious experience. Uh, the, belief, the speaker believes that an experience is sufficient to justify um, or at least contribute in some way to the justification. Now, someone who says that, now I, I, would, I would not have an issue with that, that statement. I would I had have an issue if that were the only reason upon which someone justified their belief in God. But if I were to say, hey, when I, when I pray, I have this very real sense of the presence of God. Now, uh, there would be other reasons that would ground my belief in God, but that would be one. Um, but that is an appeal to religious experience. Uh, the, the problem then, as you, if you focus or exclusively depend your, your belief in God upon an experience, is that there's really no way to distinguish the experience of, of your belief in God from, say, someone who's praying to Allah. So someone says, oh, well, I believe that Allah is, is real, as he's described in the Quran, when I, when I pray to him or when I'm whatever experience. So how do you, upon what basis do you say, well, my experience was deeper or more significant than your experience? Uh, but, but again, the epistemological framework of a statement like that is an ap appeal to religious experience. Okay, here's another statement. And, we're, and again, we're trying to think through these epistemologically. I believe in Christianity because I find the evidence for Christ's resurrection to be convincing. 
So I take the evidence, um, I, I read 1 Corinthians 15, and I believe that those documents, the, the, the document uh, that, Paul, that Paul wrote, or the copies that we have, I believe that's a reliable document. I believe it comes from an, er, er, it's an early period in, in church history. And I believe that what Paul was, uh, when he was writing to the Corinthians, that he was saying, hey, you can actually check with eyewitnesses, and they will verify, and they will say, yeah, I, we saw Jesus alive. All right. And I, and I find that very convincing. And so if, if that's if that's real, then what Jesus said is true. When Jesus said, I and the Father are one. And when Jesus made these uh, foretold his death. And, and if, if that's true, then the Old Testament is true. And then I begin. From, so from the resurrection of Christ, I begin to infer the rest of the body of, of Christian belief. Uh, so that would be upon what epistemological. Can you give us? I'm sorry. I'm interrupting. Can you give us a second? Give us like a minute or two to engage with that and maybe each person can give us like what basis and then maybe some weaknesses of it um right. let us sure. just kind of dig in a little bit i'm sorry you were probably building and i interrupted <laughs> i'm sorry no no let me let's let's uh let's that's a great idea dr Arnold. let's go ahead and pause there so um yeah okay so take that statement i believe i believe that the christianity is true because i find the evidence for christ's resurrection to be compelling Okay, and then I, let me, I'll, I'll pause in just a second. So I infer from the resurrection of Christ, the rest of Christian belief, okay? So maybe let, let's say, let's pause here and say, does anybody want to weigh in and, and say, how do you evaluate that epistemologically? What's the, what's the, uh, what's the, um, what are we saying are the conditions that satisfy my craving to actually know that? I probably should open the chat box to see if anybody's talking there. All right, so empiricism. Uh, Dr. Arnold's saying clearly evidence-based, right? So we would have a... Um, uh, we'd have an approach to uh, a poly, uh, an approach to epistemology, religious epistemology that's based on evidence. Okay, uh, yeah, Dr. K would say uh, it's rationally persuasive. So evidence uh, would be an important part of forming a rational case for Christianity. Um, uh, Peter Loveless. Uh, we are in judgment of the text and somewhat critical of the message based on our reason and logic. Okay, yeah, we're taking, I'm assuming you're talking about the, the text of 1 Corinthians 15 and evaluating that rationale and logic. Okay, good. Yeah, that would be, uh, thanks, Peter. So that would be the, uh, the epistemological framework of a statement like that. And so this would be the approach of uh, the evidentialists in apologetics. Um, looks like Dr. Arnold's defending, uh, Joel, <laughs> Paul there. <laughs> okay. Um, and anything more that you want to say about that, Dr. Arnold, or, or shall I, shall I move on? What, any thoughts there? Um, I was just typing, but I'll just read it. I, yeah. so that was in defense. On the other hand, someone can make a pretty good case that the result is I conclude Christianity is no more certain than like, you know, the Napoleonic Wars. In fact, if anything, I have better data to support the Napoleonic Wars than I do the resurrection. So that feels a little, a little awkward, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. I'm more confident of Napoleon than I am of Jesus. That, that's awkward, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the, the, uh, the case, the evidential case has its weaknesses, uh, to be sure. Um, but again, what we're evaluating is not necessarily the merits of that evi of the evidence, but we're evaluating what does that reveal about the speaker's criteria for evaluating the truth of a statement or the believability of a statement. Let's put it that way. I I'll discuss some of the terminology in a, in a bit. Um, so, okay. So again, and if I could just make this clear, what, uh, no, you're, you're good. You're good, Dr. Noel. That was, that was, uh, that was great. This is not, that's not irrelevant to the topic. Um, but what I'm trying to focus on is, is the, the, the tier below, below that and say, okay, so what, what are you, what are you saying satisfies your requirements for truth? Um, here's another one. Uh, let's say that I'm, you, you ask me, well, why do you, why do you believe in Christianity? And, and I would say to you, well, every other worldview that I have encountered 
has some sort of internal contradiction. There's something, there's just something that's wonky, something messed up. Uh, or, okay, so let's, let's say that I take a secular worldview. All right, let's say I take a completely a naturalistic worldview in which someone says the universe is a closed box. There's nothing outside of that box. There's nothing to get that to that I can um, conceive of that got that the processes that we see going, starting. There's nothing that enters into that. It's just closed. Now, to me, that, that contradicts with what I know about the law of, of causation. Uh, that something, there has to be a first mover. And, and so you have these internal contradictions into, into that naturalistic worldview. So I would say, hey, every other worldview has some sort of internal contradictions. Christianity is the only one that doesn't. Uh, and the contradictions that appeared there p to be there are, are not defeaters. They're, they're somehow uh, explicable. Um, what, what, so, okay, I've reasoned to Christianity by saying every other worldview has internal contradictions. Christianity doesn't. What's, what do you think is my epistemological basis for, for that? You see what I'm saying? What, what am I saying sat, based on that statement? What satisfies my requirements for believability? Okay, so, yeah, logical sense, rationality. Um, good. Uh, yeah, internal, so, okay, I think internal coherence really sums it up because that, I, I want my worldview to cohere, that means to hang together internally. Um, I, I, this is um, a, actually, the, the epistemological term for this is coherentism. So an, uh, an epist, uh, approach to epistemology that, that says, well, a belief is justified if it does not conflict with any other beliefs within that noetic structure is, is, uh, is coherent. So that, that means it is, it, that's coherentism. Okay, that's an approach to epistemology. Um, okay, I think I just have one other statement. Oh, here we go. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Okay, what's my epistemological warrant for that proposition of faith? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Really, in that children's song, it's an epistemological statement. Okay, uh, Kenneth said the testimony of the Word of God. Anybody else? Divine revelation, absolute authority. So this would be an appeal to authority. Um, and, and if you think about it, I, I would have no idea of the percentage, but think of all the beliefs that you hold to be true and how many of them you believe on authority. They tell me that the sun is 93 million miles from the earth. I, I, I believe that, but I only believe it because I read it somewhere. I only believe because somebody told me, well, why do I believe that? Why do I believe it from someone that told me? Well, because the person that told me, I think was reliable. Uh, so if my if my six year old son had told me that the sun was ninety three million miles from the earth, from the earth, I probably would not be warranted in believing that because the source of the testimony is not authoritative. But if I read it on NASA's official website, then I would have more warrant for believing that because of the, the source of the authority. Um, so in that respect, then um, we, we believe what I what I tried to explain to you with these. I think I have these. Uh, five statements. Each of those statements about Christianity reveals something about what I believe grounds um, my belief in, in, in uh, the faith. Um, different, different approaches. Um, so, um, let me move on here. Okay, so e each of these um, re reveals a certain epistemology. Okay, so th then the reason why I did this is because I want you to see why epistemology is at the center of Christian apologetics, because if, if apologetics is the task of commending the Christian faith uh, to someone's mind and heart, then you're going to have to assume a certain, uh, a certain something about what they find convincing. Um, so it plays, I'll just uh, wrap this segment up with this, it plays an important role in positive apologetics so when you're if you're going to say hey listen it's it's totally reasonable to believe in the claims of christianity because we have evidence of the resurrection or it's totally logical to believe in the existence of god because how else did all this get here or it's it's completely uh, I, i'm not doing anything rationally subpar i'm not flouting my responsibilities in, as an epistemic agent by saying that god is three in one 
because it, God, if he exists, probably exists in such a way that defies my comprehension. The Trinity defies my comprehension. Therefore, the Trinity probably, the God's triunity probably belongs to, um, if there is a God, he's going to be such a God that defies who I can understand completely. So those, those sort of things are ways of, um, of presenting uh, the Christian faith and appealing to a particular, um, uh, particular epistemological requirements. Um, so that's in positive apologetics. But, but then in, in negative apologetics, which is defending the Christian faith against attacks, um, uh, epistemology plays a role in, in this. So suppose someone says, hey, um, I don't believe in God because I don't think there's enough evidence for his existence. Or I don't believe in God because I think there is too much evidence to the contrary, such as uh, apparent gratuitous evil in the universe. Uh, then you can use epistemology to push back on that and say, well, what kind of evidence are you requiring to believe in the existence of God? Um, how much evil in the universe must exist before the, the scales tip in, in, against the existence of God? How do you measure a particular incident of evil in terms of its gratuity or in terms of its intensity? Like, what is your basis for evaluating all that? And why am I irrational in believing God simply even if there is not sufficient evidence? Why am I irrational in believing that? Like, upon what basis do you say that that is not rational for me to believe in God? So that's, that's epistemology in the, the role it plays in negative apologetics. It also plays a role in positive apologetics. Any uh, thoughts or, or discussion there before I, um, before I move on? Um, what I've just done in this segment is tried to explain the role of epistemology with regards to um, apologetics. Okay, I'm just going to do this just because we have to make sure. Um, and it's, uh, what do you say? Just give us a, like a, a really, just to make sure we're super clear because epistemology may be a word we use regularly or it might not. Um, just a quick nutshell, I think you said it at the beginning, but I'll just come back around it again. Nutshell statement of epistemology. What is the word? What are we talking about? Um, it's the theory of how we know that we know. And I'm about to get into that a little more deeply. I kind of wanted to, uh, us to jump in the deep end at this point, and, and I'm, I'm going to define some terms. But, but yeah, in a nutshell, epistemology is the theory of knowledge. It's, it's how, we, how we know that we know. All right, thanks. Sorry to jump ahead of you. I just knew that that was your next topic. I wanted to help you segue into the next topic. <laughs> well, hey, Thank you. please feel free to jump in anytime, okay? Um, okay, so yeah, and that leads me to the, so first of all, uh, I wanted to talk about the role of epistemology and apologetics, and now we want to talk about epistemology in general, because Epistemology is not a conversation that's limited to Christianity or apologetics. Obviously, it's a really, really important topic in, in philosophy. So epistemology would be a branch of philosophy. You have in philosophy, you have metaphysics, axiology, uh, and epistemology. Axiology would deal with the questions of aesthetics and beauty and ethics. Um, but epistemology deals with the question of knowledge. And, and really... Um, uh, so ep epistemology plays an important role, say, in, um, in the courtroom um, when, when a, a, a lawyer presents his case or when a defendant is defending himself. Like, okay, so the jury is trying to decide what's, what kind of evidence would be sufficient to uh, convict this uh, person or to ex ex exonerate this person. So these are uh, broad issues, but we're going to talk about epistemology in general here. So let me ask you this question. Um, <laughs> I just, uh, I just saw my wife is weighing in here. <laughs> Great. Okay. I, I, I have the, the chat screen, um, uh, cover, uh, covered by my lecture notes. So I'm not seeing everything that comes in immediately. Uh, just so you know. Um, okay. What would, what would you say? Uh, satisfies conditions for knowledge. Okay, if, if someone um, tells you, I know that Brett Kavanaugh is unfit uh, to serve on the Supreme Court. Uh, if you're, some of you may not be into American politics at all, but this has been a big deal in, in America. Uh, now, he has been confirmed 
uh, to, as a as a judge on the Supreme Court. But what would you say? Um, but but if you were to say, I know, I know that he is unfit to serve on the Supreme Court, or perhaps I would say this: I know that Dr. Arnold is in Manila right now. I know that. All right. What what needs to be in place for for knowledge to be going on? Okay, so so Peter said, well, what's your evidence? Yeah, okay, so I've got to have my evidence. Um, so evidence would, we would say, if it's sufficient, would justify that belief, right? Okay, and I'm going to use the word justify. Please, please understand this. It, throughout, I don't think I'm ever going to use the word justify in the sense of the atonement in the rest of this lecture, okay? So justification here is referring to... Uh, certain things being in an appropriate place to constitute knowledge. Okay, actual, actual knowledge of an event. <laughs> what do we mean by evidence? That, that's, um, I have no idea. No one knows what we mean, <laughs> what we mean by evidence. Um, uh, so we're just going to have to wait to la leave some things really blurry until a little bit later, okay? Uh, Google does have answers, but it doesn't have the answers. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit too. <clears throat> okay, so Dr. Arnold's in the Philippines. Is Kenneth C., are you in the Philippines or are you somewhere else in the world? He's in Singapore. Okay, so you're not actually, so Kenneth is not actually in Manila. See, Joel could have set up this room in in South Carolina that looked like his apartment, his, his uh, building in Manila. And I don't really, I don't really know that for sure. So again, we're going to have to talk about, okay, does his wife verify it? But she could be lying. So Joel could have like paid her big time to lie about this. All right. <laughs> but Kenneth was there last week. But like I said, Joel has a week to set this room up to look like it's in, in South Carolina and, and uh, be on Zoom with us. So th this is good. This is exactly what we're talking about. How, what does it take to really say, I know that Dr. Arnold is in, is in Manila? Um, so here's what epistemologists talk about. Here's the terminology that they use when they talk about knowledge. <laughs> um, knowledge, they say, is justified true belief. Okay? Justified true belief. And I want to explain what this means. Um, I, we're going to have to use this word justified in a very hazy way, okay, at, at the beginning, and we're getting, we'll get more specific about that. Um, now, suppose you, uh, a good friend of yours tells you that his great-grandfather is Harry Truman, a president of the United States. Um, now, your friend has never lied to you before. Uh, you are surprised to hear this, but you feel that you are justified in, in uh, believing this because he is a trustworthy person. Now, let me ask you this. Do you know that? If so, if, if, do you know that your friend's grandfather is, a great-grandfather is Harry Truman? Well, suppose uh, your friend was lying to you. Um, and it's not true that his great-grandfather is Harry Truman. Would it be appropriate to, for, for, to call that knowledge? Now, it's a belief, right? You believe that his great-grandfather is Jeremy Truman, but we wouldn't call that knowledge. Why not? Because it doesn't satisfy the prerequisites. Justified true belief. The belief has to be about something, uh, um, a true condition. Um, yeah, right. So his, say, his parents misinformed him. Okay, still, if it is not true that his that Terry Truman is his great-grandfather, then that belief cannot constitute knowledge. It has to be true. Um, okay, so here's another, uh, here, um, okay, let me ask you this question then. So, were people justified in believing that the sun revolved around the earth in, in, uh, in the Middle Ages? Yes, they were absolutely justified in believing that. Um, because they had lots of good reasons. I, if I didn't know much about astronomy, I, I would assume the same thing. <laughs> it looks like the sun is going around the earth. Um, I, are you justified in believing that? Does that, is that constitute knowledge? No, because it's actually not true. Okay. Now, what about, what if you believe something that is true, but you're not justified in believing it? 
Okay, so what I'm doing is testing this definition of knowledge as justified true belief. Okay, let me let me give this bizarre example. It will sound sound bizarre at first, but but it'll make sense eventually. Suppose okay, I'm in actually Dr. Arnold. You said Connecticut. I'm actually in New Hampshire. Okay, <laughs> so that's all right. Yeah, they're they're close. The same thing, right? <laughs> okay, so I'm in <laughs> I'm in Concord, New Hampshire. And let's say that I'm, I'm at a Starbucks there and I think I see Dr. Arnold, okay? As it turns out, it's just a really good looking guy that looks like Dr. Arnold, but it's, it's, not, it's not him, okay? But let's say that upon, that upon that basis, I believe that Dr. Arnold is in Concord, New Hampshire. Okay, so it, it turns out that I didn't actually see him. It just was a guy that looked like him, however, in a surprising turn of events, Dr. Arnold actually was in Concord, New Hampshire. <laughs> so I told my wife, hey, I saw Joel today. Now, I know I saw Joel. Uh, I, I, that's what I claim. Does my, not, does my belief that Dr. Arnold was in Concord, New Hampshire, does that constitute knowledge? Um, no. Why, even, well, it was true, though. He was in Concord, New Hampshire. Um, yeah, okay, it was a lucky guess. So in other words, my knowledge, my belief was true, but not justified. It, yeah, right, it was a false basis, okay? So, and th this is a, just a really important thing. It's possible to have beliefs about propositions that are true without coming to them on the proper basis, and we can't call that knowledge then, all right? This, this is just a really important concept to grasp because you might... Um, uh, you, you might say uh, you, you put a coin in a, in a jar that's, or they put a coin in a box and, and shake that coin up and then say, I know that it's heads. And you take the lid off and it's heads. Well, that doesn't really constitute knowledge. That was a guess. Um, so knowledge has to be something that would arrive to by a proper process, what that we call justification. What that is, we, we can talk about later and it's, we won't have time to explore. Justification is a massive topic in epistemology. Um, and but it has to also be true. So that's why I say justified true belief. Now, how does this apply to uh, apologetics? Well, here's, here's a connection. Um, people might say this, okay, you believe in God. It might be true. It might not be true. Uh, it, but you're not justified in believing it because there's insufficient, insufficient evidence for it. So they could say, hey, just because there might, just because there happens to be a God, and you might be right about that. You're still irrational in believing God because there's, because, um, because God, here, here's a Kantian kind of argument. God is of such a transcendent nature that no, that no human category is gonna apply to him and, and actually we can't even think about him because he's transcendent. Therefore, <laughs> if there is a God, then you can't really know it. And that, that would be an argument that people, people say. So, um, th this is my whole e explanation is that for something to constitute knowledge it has to be justified, justified, true belief. All right. Now, this takes us to some different models of human knowledge. And I already mentioned coherentism. Um, that is, if things are justified, uh, uh, this, and I'm, de I'm delving more deeply now into this concept of justification. I've talked about it in general terms, right? What does it take to justify a belief? Well, sufficient evidence, does it, does it make sense? Now let's kind of get into more of this in detail. Coherentism, something is justified if it hangs together in a coherent way, if, there's, um, if there are not internal contradictions in your noetic structure. Uh, here's, another, here's another theory of a model of human knowledge. Okay, so just to back up here, what I'm, what I'm gonna, th these three things that I'm gonna give you are, are models of human knowledge, or models of epistemology, theories about ju how justification takes place. Coherentism is one that be a belief is justified if it is coherent with other beliefs in your system. Reliable reliabilism, which is a belief is justified if you arrived at that belief through a reliable process. Uh, so I arrived at the belief that um, uh, I, I arrive at the belief that, that, that two and two is four through a reliable process of adding them. 
Okay, I took two and I added it to two and I got four. That's a pretty reliable process. So I'm justified in that belief based on this whole idea of reliabilism. Okay, that's one model upon which beliefs can be justified. And the third model is this, foundationalism. Okay, so coherentism, reliabilism, and foundationalism. And foundationalism is going, I'm going to expand on foundationalism. And the reason why I'm going to expand on it is because foundationalism has been the pervading theory of knowledge for most of Western, the history of Western thought. And, and that is foundationalism that is that a belief is justified if it rests on another belief that 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 is I'm going to put it this way, a basic belief. Okay. So let's do this. Let's think of our, I want to give you a term here and the term is noetic structure. And I've used it before. The noetic structure is that a building that is, con let's say that all your thoughts are like all your beliefs, sorry, all your beliefs are like bricks in a building. And all those br bricks have got to be on some sort of foundation. Okay. What kind of foundation, what kind of epistemic foundation is sufficient to support every other belief that you have? Well, according to this theory of knowledge, foundationalism, in order for this belief to have a proper part in your noetic structure, it must rest ultimately on a basic belief. All right. So let's throw this out here. What do you think, what kind of, what kind of basic beliefs do you think are appropriate to, according to this theory of knowledge, to be the foundation for all your other beliefs. Any thoughts here? What kind of beliefs must you have at the, the okay, we exist. God exists, okay, good. Now, actually, let me just clarify something here. The, the, the two things that were just said, we exist and God exists, are, are not kinds of beliefs, but those are beliefs themselves. All right, so what I'm asking is um, describe the kind of belief, not the, not the proposition, but the nature of that proposition. Okay, supposition, <laughs> cogito ergo sum. Um, all right, let me, let me give it to you here um, because this is, I'm playing one of those games where you're trying to guess what is in the teacher's mind and that's never a good question in a classroom setting. <laughs> Um, so he, here are here, according to the theory of knowledge called foundationalism, here are the kinds of beliefs that belong at the foundation. One kind is beliefs that are self-evident. Okay. So, um, two plus two equals four is self-evident. Um, you, you can't, if someone were to say, or let's say one plus one equals two, if someone were able to say, um, base 10. <laughs> um, that's good. That's good. If somebody were able to say, prove it, one plus one equals two, prove it. I can't do it. Okay. There is no proof. Uh, you, you just, you, ha you just, you either see it or you don't. It's self-evident. Um, uh, so that, that's one kind of belief that, yeah. So Dr. Arnold said axioms and Euclidean geometry. Okay. So yeah, things that are like, okay, once you see it, you, you see it. Um, Here's another kind of belief. Uh, um, ones that are self-evident, ones that are um, evident to the senses. Okay, and there's a difference here. So um, it, it's evident to my senses that this is that this is a yellow highlighter. Okay, it's just evident. If you try to convince me that it's blue, I'm like, I just just can't do that. All right, it's just self-evident. So I'm saying that something that's that's uh, sorry, this is evident to the senses. I'm sorry, evident to the senses. Self-evident would be two plus two equals four. Evident to the senses would be, this is yellow. Um, or another one would be incorrigible. They call this, this is in epistemology, they call it incorrigible. In other words, I just can't find myself denying it. Let's say that an incorrigible belief for me would be that I am lecturing to you on epistemology or that, that I have the experience of lecturing to you in epistemology. Uh, conceivably, I could be dreaming that I'm doing this, but I, I cannot deny that I'm having the experience that I'm doing this. So I can at least say that this is an incorrigible thing. Now, how is this all relevant to uh, apologetics and, and epistemology? In this sense, I've given you, according to the foundationalist structure of human knowledge, 
that there are three kinds of beliefs that properly found every other belief. This is what, this is the foundational structure. Um, are these, if everything that you believe must rest on one of these three kinds of beliefs, is there anything missing from our noetic structure? In other words, is this really sufficient to ground everything that we need to believe? Um, and this is where, uh, it, it, okay, so suppose you accept foundationalism as your epistemology. And so if someone were to say, hey, why do you believe God that God exists? Justify your belief in God's existence. If you accept foundationalism, what you must do is take the proposition God exists and seek to connect it to, a, to something that is self-evident, evident to the senses, or incorrigible. Right? You've, if you accept foundationalism, you're, you're, almost, you're subscribing to the rules of the game of epistemology that says, okay, here it goes. Now I'm going to have to prove God that that proposition, uh, God exists. I'm going to have to prove that with, in, in, in this um, theory of knowledge called foundationalism. Now, the problem with foundationalism, which, as I said earlier, has been the reigning theory of knowledge for most of Western, the history of Western philosophy, the problem with it is this is that you cannot ground foundationalism within foundationalism. Uh, and let me explain that. Um, if someone were to say, any belief that you hold must be justified upon the basis of something that is evident to the senses, self-evident or incorrigible, then you could ask that person, you just gave me a statement, a proposition. Can you justify that proposition by something that's self-evident incorrigible or self-evident of the senses and the problem with foundationalism is that it can't right there it, it, let's say i let suppose take this take this statement um anything that you believe must be justified upon the basis of a belief that's incorrigible self-evident or evident of the senses and i say well that statement itself is not incorrigible self-evident or evident of the senses so you have a big problem you have some, uh, a system of epistemology, a theory of knowledge that cannot support itself. And that's why uh, some Christian thinkers have come along and they've said, no, 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 we have to allow for more kinds of beliefs at the base of our noetic structure. If you're going to say it's just this, we're going to call this narrow or strict foundationalism. We need to, we need to adopt something that's, a, that's broader. Why do I say that? Because there are way too many beliefs that we need to function in this world that aren't grounded in this narrow way. I'll give you some examples. Here, here's one. I believe that Dr. Arnold has a mind. Um, now, that is a very important assumption for operating within this world. Um, those of you who are married, if you suppose that your spouse does not have a mind, um, then you're going to get real, real, real problems in your marriage, okay? If you live with the assumption that they don't have a mind. However, uh, the mind is not something you can see. Uh, it's not something that is incorrigible. It's not something that's self-evident or evident to the senses. Um, it's something that you believe on the basis of, of, um, of uh, j j you, you have to believe that in order to function, that, uh, the existence of other minds. And by mind, we independent, real conscious experience. Um, yeah, so um, th there, are just, there, there are far too many beliefs. Uh, if you could picture this way, okay, so this is, the, this is the narrow foundation of foundationalism, right? And I have a belief over here that would collapse if I only, if I, if I try to justify everything right here. I need something that's, that's broader. Um, and so here's where, uh, what, I want to introduce this idea of, of reformed epistemology. Here's this idea that Alvin Plantinga has popularized, where he has said this, belief in God belongs to that basic, basic belief. It's okay. In fact, it's perfectly rational for me to say God exists without having to justify that uh, according to a belief that is self-evident, evident to the senses, or incorrigible. In, in other words, this, if you call a basic belief a belief that's one of one of those kinds um 
someone would say, well, belief in God isn't proper. It's not a proper belief because it's not based, based on this. Well, a planting, a planting would say, says who? Sa- says who? Who says that belief in God is not, is not belong to the foundation of your beliefs? And, and planting says, I, I, say, I say it does. I say that you are perfectly rational in looking at a sunset and having within yourself the sense that there, there must be a creator, even if you're not aware of the process at which you arrived at that belief. Like, how strict do the standards of, of rationality have to be that every belief you hold has, has to be scrutinized in that way? Most of what we believe then would be, we'd have to chuck if we applied those same standards to. So the, the, the narrow foundationalists, um, the narrow, narrow foundationalism as an approach to epistemology is simply insufficient to ground um, a, a lot of what we believe. Um, so, and, and this this uh, brings me to then a discussion of Alvin Plantinga and reform epistemology. And that would be, he would say, we're, we need to call um, the belief in God properly basic because it is a belief from which we derive our understanding of the world around us, from which we reason rather than to which we reason. Um, Okay, I'm going to pause right there and see if there's any any questions or discussions uh, on that. I mean, here was one random question. Uh, when you said reformed epistemology, do we, so is this like a broader philosophical term, as in you throw this out, reformed epistemology, or do we mean reformed like Calvin reformed? Okay, I'm about to get there. This is, Joel, you're like perfectly segueing my, uh, my, my points, because I, yeah, I'll, you know? Yeah, this is great. This is great. Uh, it, we, before I go there, though, let, I'll just see if there's any other dis- discussion on, on what I just covered. Because I realize that this whole idea of theories of knowledge and, and noetic structure and all that can be a little bit like, what, what's the point of that? But really, it really is relevant because um, when you're talking to someone who is insisting on these strict standards of rationality, they're, they're not applying that to all their beliefs. They're only applying to the beliefs they don't agree with. Um, and so we have to include more at the base of our structure than what these uh, strict foundationalists will allow. How about just a, like a, I don't know, two minute example, um, like solipsism. If you want to talk about that for a second, just kind of, I guess, to give the kind of the idea like the, yeah, admittedly absurd things that get thrown out there, but when we really think about it, it's hard to know how we know anything and, and how frustrating it is to try to pin down how we know anything at all. Um, is that a direction you want to go, or is that worth our time? Yeah, so so that would relate to this idea of the existence of other minds. So Alvin Plantinga wrote a, a, a book, or one of his early books was God and Other Minds, and where he said, we've got to believe in other minds, and, and a belief in God would uh, belong in the category of belief in other minds, simply something that's not... Um, you know, it's it's not some uh, an argument that we can make according to strict standards of foundationalism, but we must hold those. Now, solipsism, of course, is this idea that uh, you are the only person in, that exists, and everything else is an extension of your imagination. It's really hard to refute a, uh, solipsism because, I mean, if if someone would walk, walk up to me and said and say, "Hey, solipsism is fault is." It, you, you can't, you can't believe that. You can't believe that you're the only person that exists. I mean, after all, I'm here. I'm like, hi, you little figment of my, my, my imagination. You know, you're just, basically everything else is something that I believe in. Now, this is a, a funny thing with solipsism. I, one of my professors <laughs> said that he was visiting a, a university or for, for some con- conference, and there was a professor, at, another professor at that school who was a real solipsist. And uh, he, he said, uh, he said there was a like a gaggle of students that would be following this this solipsist all around just you know just up with him he said like why he 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 asked one of the students he said oh, why why are, why is everyone following him around and the student the student turned to him and said hey because if he goes we all go <laughs> right <laughs> it's like cuz if if we're all just in a figment of his imagination then if if he's uh if if he's out of the picture puff we're gone too so just kind of a humorous thing solipsism is is absurd but it's hard to refute um which which i think means that we have to base our beliefs on more than just what we can rationally uh prove according to this strict according to strict foundationalism um <clears throat> so the the conclusion the reason why I bring up Alvin Plantinga is because he has been a pivotal figure in the in 
modern philosophy uh, and epistemology. Um, if if you haven't read it, I, this is a little bit of a tough read. All all his. I'll, I'll tell you what. I'll show you the books I have. So. I have more than this, but these were all that I, I could find. So here is kind of his, this is, is kind of his, one of his magnum, this is magnum opus, Warranted Christian Belief. It's, it's pretty thick. It's uh, almost 500 pages, um, and, but it's got this just compelling cover design. So, um, I mean, you can't help but pick it up in the bookstore. You could tell why this is such a bestseller. Uh, but actually, I really, I've really enjoyed it. He's, he's a good writer. A lot of his stuff is very technical. Uh, again, here is a, a collection of his essays. Again, amazing, compelling cover design, uh, but really good, <laughs> really good content. I'm being facetious, by the way. Uh, his, this is a collection of essays that he didn't write them all, but uh, Faith and Rationality. Um, one of his, if you do read something by him, I would recommend reading his essay, Reason and Belief in God. Reason and Belief in God. It's, it's not easy reading, but it, it expresses some of his core concepts. Uh, another one that might be interesting for you to read is his, um, it's actually started as, a, as a, uh, an address, I think it's some graduation ceremony, I don't know exactly what, but it's called Advice to Christian Philosophers. And his whole exhortation is that uh, Christians should be unapologetic, uh, unashamed of their Christian assumptions. Um, so... Uh, anyway, that's that's planting a um, and okay. So this whole I, and his main concept, if you if you think of planting a, think this, that um, you can believe in God without arguments for it. Like you are perfectly rational, justified. Um, you're not doing anything strange or subpar by saying, I, yeah, belief in God belongs to the ba my basic, properly basic beliefs, and that's that's and that's totally fine. Um, we shouldn't be put cornered into somehow defending our belief in God on by their rules. Okay, why is it called Reformed epistemology? Well, um, I don't know who ex who named it this, but Plantinga derives a lot of his thoughts from John Calvin, and that's why it's called Reformed epistemology because Calvin, and I, I want to, um, I, I because this is so important, I'm, I'm holding. Uh, this Calvin's Institutes here, near the beginning of his institutes, Calvin expresses um, this idea of belief in God that's apart from arguments. Did, did you have a... Oh, oh, let me write the author's name. There you go. Oh, Joel already got it. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I need to be up on the, on the chat. Okay, so... Um, so you, you might come across this term, a sensus divinitatis. That means this, a sense of an awareness of the deity of God. Um, so this is what Calvin says, and, and Plantinga is reaching back to John Calvin, and Calvin is reaching back to the Apostle Paul, okay? So uh, it's, did you get that article? Awesome. So it's, it's pretty, it's, it, this is Romans 1 stuff, okay? But, but consider how Calvin expresses this. This is from uh, book one, chapter three. The title of the book of the chapter is The Knowledge of God Naturally Implanted in the Human Mind. Calvin writes that there exists in the human minds and indeed by natural instinct, some sense of deity we hold to be beyond dispute since God himself to prevent any man from pretending ignorance has endued all men with some idea of his Godhead the memory of which he constantly renews and occasionally enlarges that all to a man being aware that there is a God and that he is their maker may be condemned by their own conscience when they neither worship him nor consecrate their lives to his service. Does that remind you of Romans one? I and mean, this is essentially what Calvin is doing. He's, this is an exposition of Romans one. Certainly if there is any quarter where it may be supposed that God is unknown, the most likely for such an instance to exist is among the dullest tribes farthest from civilization, but there is no nation so barbarous, no race so brutish as not to be imbued with the conviction that there is a God. Even those who, in other respects, seem to differ least from the lower animals, constantly retain some sense of religion. And here, here's what he says. 
Since then, there never has been from the very first any quarter of the globe, any city, any household even, without religion. This amounts to a tacit confession that a sense of deity is inscribed on every heart. And that's where we get this idea of, uh, and so what Plantinga is doing, he's, he's borrowing from Calvin this category of this sense of deity inscribed in every heart, which obviously Calvin is just taking from Paul when he says that, yeah, we know from the created things of the world that there is a God. We know his power and Godhead. And, and so Planting is saying, yeah, this is, just belongs to the basics of our noetic structure. That's why it's called Reformed Epistemology. And that would be in contrast to, a, say, the epistemology of a Thomas Aquinas, who said, well, we can perfectly synthesize uh, a Christian belief with Aristotelian categories. And in, in fact, we have to, to make it rational. Um, is that a Zam, Zamthon Leon? That's very interesting to know the terminology derived to from John. Was that a question or just an observation? I'll, I'll let you answer that as I, as I move on here. So that, yeah, that's why it's called Reformed Epistemology. And it's becoming, uh, you, you can look it up on Wikipedia and, and, uh, and stuff. Um, Oh, are you asking how we know that it's derived from John Calvin's writing? Well, I've not read it in the Latin, but I'm, I understand that, that, that what he said in that sentence there, a sense of deity is inscribed in every heart, that, that I'm reading from Calvin's Institutes right here, is that in Latin is the sensus divinitatis. That, that, and then when you read, actually, Warranted Christian Belief, um, he, he, cites, he cites Calvin in, in this book, planting a set, cites Calvin. Um, Okay, uh, let's let me just let me move on here. Any anything, um, any observations or questions on that before I move on? If you want, uh, we could go ahead and take our five minute break now. Or if you have yeah, a that's concept, great. Whatever you want to do. Yeah, that's great. Let's take a break now, Diane. All right, excellent. Uh, okay, I have. Uh, one minute until the hour, so I will see you all back at four minutes after the hour, and we'll talk from there. Excellent. Thank you. We're wrapping up this idea of reformed epistemology, and the idea that Plantinga has uh, helped advance is that belief in God belongs to those beliefs in our basic structure. Um, and we, so a person is completely justified in believing in God without having arrived at that belief at a certain, through a certain process of arguments, okay? Uh, so belief in God, we would say, is properly basic. So someone that says, well, you can't believe in God because there's insufficient evidence, or because it's irrational to believe in a God who would allow evil in the universe, or whatever other reasons he may present, well, then you could simply push back and say, well, upon what basis are you saying that belief in God is, what's your standards, epistemic standards for rationality? Uh, why should I play according to your rules? Um, now, this brings up a big question in apologetics then. If belief in God, and by implication, if you were to read um, planting a further, he, he tries to extrapolate from that some specific tenets of the Christian faith and how we're justified in believing them. If it's properly basic, if belief in God is not something that is arrived to through a process of argumentation, then what is the role of apologetics? What is the role of arguments for the existence of God? What is the role for evidence for Christ the Christian faith and all that? Um, so let me just get you to think about that a little bit. If, if we can say, hey, belief in God is properly basic, what does that do to arguments and evidences for the Christian faith? Does that mean, hey, uh, we, don't, we can just shut down this apologetics class now because uh, Plantinga has just told us that we can believe in God without <laughs> evidence, you know? Um, what's the role of apologetics now? Um, does that mean that we don't do need to do it? Does it mean that uh, we could just tell people uh, if they say, I don't believe in God, then we can just say, well, you're stupid. End of story. I mean, really, what, what's, what is the role of apologetics now? Dr. Arnold says it's I, uh, profitable, still poke holes in the guy's other's view springboard into objections discussion strengthens our faith okay excellent um 
to check the position. Yeah, and, and this is a big point that Plantinga wants to make. He's saying that this, this doesn't mean uh, that arguments don't apply anymore. What this does mean, however, is that when we look at the world around us, this is exactly the sort of world we would expect given the propositions of the Christian faith. Uh, if, if God exists, this, it, 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 it's exactly the sort of world that we would expect that it'd be a world of order and harmony and, and exploding with beauty, uh, a, a world that we want to explore. This is just exactly the sort of, a world in which there is, is causation and, and reason and understanding in which our, our minds can properly grasp what's going on here. Um, so, uh, furthermore, uh, we can expect a world that has been tainted by the sins of human beings. Um, so the, the role of arguments and evidence doesn't just go away. They serve more of a kind of um, a, a confirmatory role. Like, yeah, I, I believe in God, and doesn't this make sense now? Uh, this, is this is precisely the kind of world that I would expect given my basic beliefs about God's existence and nature. And that's what happens. So, uh, and, and then you can go the other way, what Dr. Arnold said. Okay, now, and, and this is it, it taken, given your worldview, speaking to, say, a secular uh, materialist, or uh, uh, given your worldview, this is not the kind of world that we'd expect. It wouldn't work, given your assumptions. Um, and that would be uh, what would happen to apologetics there. Um, Okay, so that's Reformed Epistemology. There's so much more that can be said about that, um, but I want to move on to uh, some of my specific thoughts for the epistemology of Christian apologetics. Okay, so I'm, what I'm going to do is I will give you uh, five statements um, that as I think through this whole topic of epistemology and apologetics, um, I would like to argue that Whatever epistemology a Christian adopts, a Christian apologist adopts, your epistemology, your theory of knowledge must account for these five um, components, okay? And, and the first one is this. Uh, your, your, when you adopt an, an epistemology or a theory of knowledge as an apologist, uh, it must account for commonly shared epistemic standards among believers and unbelievers, um, it must account, I'll say that again, whatever epistemology you adopt in your apologetic strategy, it must account for commonly shared epistemic standards among believers and unbelievers. And, and here's what I mean by that. To say, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, is true and perfectly fine. Uh, that would be, that's sufficient for belief. But the authority of Scripture may not be within the epistemic standards of an unbeliever. And it's not conceding to his uh, unbelief to bring in other considerations to support the propositions of Christianity. So you can say, yes, the Bible is authoritative, and the Bible tells me this. But also, there's also evidence, and there's also reason. And bringing, bringing in evidence and reason is considering his epistemic standards without violating the authority of the Word of God. There's no problem with doing that. So when you do apologetics, your, your epistemology can account for the commonly shared epistemic standards among believers and unbelievers, things that we share in common. Um, you can uh, remind an unbeliever that um, that they believe in a lot of things that must be believed in order to function properly in this world. Okay, so that's the first thing. Uh, commonly shared epistemic standards among believers and unbelievers. Um, he here's another thing that whatever epistemology you adopt as a Christian apologist, whatever theory of knowledge, you're going to say, hey, this will be convincing. Uh, here's another one. You have to account for the various legitimate ways in which people find themselves convinced of a particular belief. This is kind of what we discussed um, last week when we talked just the introductory lecture to apologetics, in that sometimes people are convinced by reason. Sometimes 
an objection may exist in their minds about the apparent incompatibility of an omnibenevolent, omnipotent, omniscient God and the existence of evil in this world. Uh, and you may need to present some arguments as to why the existence of evil in the world is the result of an optimally good world that, that uh, has morally free agents and a sovereign God in it. Okay, so you can present arguments like that, and that might be convincing to a person. But another person might be absolutely convinced by, say, the uh, compelling, that, that might be a factor. I'm saying the, your argument against, uh, about the um, presence of evil might be a factor in convincing them. But another factor that might be uh, persuasive uh, uh, toward the Christian belief might be the compelling um, love that God showed to them in sending Jesus to die on the cross for them. And ultimately, that's what they have to put their faith in. Or, or it could be a sense of their own guilt and insufficiency that, you, that you'd bring to bear. These are things, this is a commonly shared epistemic standard. This is something that people know. This is perfectly legitimate for you to appeal to. And, and you have to understand what are, so, what are the ways that people find themselves convinced of a particular belief. It will vary according to the person's personality, their education level, their, their gender, all these sort of factors. But as a Christian apologist, you have to understand that uh, the ways that people form beliefs um, there are many legitimate ways that people form beliefs, and we shouldn't be afraid to, um, to do whatever, is, whatever means are necessary in helping them uh, come to those conclusions. Um, okay, so again, to, to remind you what I'm doing, I'm saying whatever epistemology as a Christian apologist you adopt, it must account for, number one, commonly shared epistemic standards among believers and unbelievers. Uh, number two, various legitimate ways in which people find themselves convinced of a particular belief. And number three, when, as a Christian apologist, and you're thinking about epistemology, your epistemology must account for sin's cognitive damage. You have to understand that you're not talking to blank slates. We're talking to people with an innate uh, rebellion, an innate uh, aversion to the central message of the gospel. Uh, people are not innately repulsed by the idea of a God. In fact, most people believe that there is a God. What we are innately repulsed to is the idea that this God stands in judgment over us because of our sin, and the only thing that can uh, satisfy God's just wrath is the death of his Son, and when we believe in Jesus Christ as our Savior. Now, that is innately repulsive. And, and furthermore, there are so many weird and perverted quirks in our thinking that will confuse us about the, the nature of this God, so much so that we think that he is a God that we can manipulate and manage. When you're talking to someone who's an unbeliever, you're talking to someone whose mind has been utterly ravaged by the effects of sin. Um, we call these the noetic effects of the fall, sin's cognitive damage. We're not talking, we're not talking to people that are um, uh, we're not talking to just pure computers, minds that have been undamaged. There's, there's something going on here. And for that, I do want to, uh, you know Romans chapter 1, but think of, think of these verses with regard to epistemology, okay? What, what is going on here is Paul is, he's not using the word epistemology, but it's, it, the discussion in Romans 1 is an epistemological discussion. For what can be known about God is plain to men, plain to human beings, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to see that on the on the screen. That's good. Um, can can you flip down to um, to verse twenty two? Then we can we see verse twenty two. Um, yeah, yeah. Claiming to be wise, they begin fools, exchange the glory of the immortal God. Um, th what what they're doing is we are substituting a proper knowledge of God for something that is manageable, something that is um, 
uh, less than God. This is the nature of the human heart. This, these are the, the cognitive effects of the fall, the fact that sin distorts our understanding of God. And look, there's judgment in this as well. They did not see fit to acknowledge of God, so God gave them up to, to, a, to a debased mind. What's, what's going on here? This is, this is epistemology. This is, this is the fall. These are the, these are the effects of sin. So whatever epistemology you adopt um, in your doing apologetics, you can't ignore the fact that um, you can't ignore the cognitive effects of the fall. Uh, I also want to um, uh, just, just read a section to you on, um, from Alvin Planting on this, because he has a, he has a great uh, discussion of sin and its cognitive consequences. Um, he says uh, he says this. Uh, um, Suffice it to say that we human beings have indeed fallen from a pristine state into sin, a condition that involves both intellect and will. It is an effect of malaise, a malfunction or madness of the will, but it is also a cognitive condition. Uh, you think about the effects of pride on your mind. Um, l- listen to what he says. Here. Due to that basic and aboriginal sin, pride, I may unthinkingly and almost without noticing assume that I am the center of the universe. And of course, if you ask me, I will deny thinking any such thing thus vastly exaggerating the importance of what happens to me as opposed to what happens to others. I may vastly overestimate my own attainments and accomplishments, consequently discounting the accomplishments of others. I may also fail to perceive my own sin or see it as less distasteful than it really is. I may fail to see myself as a creature who, if not viewed through the lens of Christ's sacrifice, would be worthy of divine punishment. Thus, among the ravages of sin is my very failure to note those ravages. Okay, you see what he's saying there is as excellent. He says, it is the very nature of sin to make us ignore the consequences of sin. And so when I'm doing apologetics, I have to be very aware. All I'm trying, all I'm trying to say is this, that your epistemology has got to be informed by sin's cognitive uh, damage effects. Okay, um, uh, fourth, and this is really important. And this goes right, uh, this segues right from sin's cognitive damage. That means that my epistemology as a Christian apologist must account for the role of the Holy Spirit in providing supernatural epistemic apparatus. <laughs> if I think that this is all accomplished by reasons and evidence and properly basic beliefs and all this, I, I'm, I'm a fool because nothing can convince me of this utterly repulsive idea that I am a sinner condemned in the sight of God other than God's Holy Spirit working in my heart to convict me of sin and show me how wrong I am and how I need a savior, this is contrary to fallen human nature. Um, this, is, this is precisely what Paul is, is saying in, in a, a 1 Corinthians. And I'm actually going to turn there and, and read these, these words as well. Um, this, is, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11. Uh, he, after quoting this uh, section from the Old Testament in which Paul, uh, Paul says, who, what, yeah, can you go to 1 Corinthians 2? I'll just read it here. This is verse, uh, let's start with verse 9. <clears throat> uh, yeah, as it is written, what no eye has seen nor ear heard nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. Now Paul is expressing, if you could think about it this way, an epistemology of the Holy Spirit. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. How do we know certain things? We know them upon the basis of the Holy Spirit's revelation to us. This is not unreasonable for us to believe. If there is a God, we would say, which is a belief which belongs to our properly basic uh, beliefs in our noetic structure, then it is entirely possible for God to communicate to us through his spirit. And it's entirely possible for the communications of the Holy Spirit to happen in the hearts of believers, for the spirit searches everything, even the depths of, of God. Who knows the person's thought except the spirit of that person that is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given to us by God. What he's saying is that without the Holy Spirit, there are certain things we cannot accept. Verse 14, the natural person, that is the person who is not trusted in Christ, does not accept the things of the spirit of God, for they are folly to him. He is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. That has got to play into our apologetics. That to a certain degree, 
Although we can do everything we can to clear the way, God's Spirit has to step in and do the work that we cannot do as apologists. We're kind of, we're messenger boys. We're just, we, we carry the message. We do the best we possibly can. Um, but ultimately, it's God's Spirit that's going to have to convince uh, people of their sin uh, and, and to, to, to trust in Christ. So uh, again, what I'm saying is, is that whatever epistemology you adopt, it has to account for, um, actually, let me exit full screen here. There we go. Um, has to account for uh, commonly shared epistemic standards, sins, uh, the various legitimate ways in which people find themselves convinced, sins, cognitive damage, and the role of the Holy Spirit. Um, and I, I said there's five, but actually my fifth statement is kind of a summary of them. And that is that the conclusion is that one's epistemology must be broad enough to adapt to a wide variety of epistemic standards depending on the person you're talking to. Um, I, I would refuse, what I, what I don't mean by that is that I'm conceding to a narrow foundationalism as we talked about earlier and say, oh, well, I guess I'm kind of uh, limited to what I can do because uh, I, I have to ground belief in God upon this, the, only these three basic kinds of belief. I'm not saying that we need to concede to that, but I can say, hey, it's not illegitimate. It, it's, it's not illegitimate for me to present those kind of arguments, but neither is it necessary to sustain belief in God. Um, so your epistemology must be broad enough to adapt to a wide variety of epistemic standards, depending on the person you're talking to. Um, so, you know, and I'll, I'll conclude with, with this and then Dr. Arnold and I will have a little back and forth maybe, uh, at the close here. Um, and when you read the Bible, it might be helpful for you to think when, when certain appeals are being made to people to believe, you'll, you'll read this all throughout the Old Testament and all throughout the New Testament. God is urging his people to come to him. Uh, he's trying to stir in them belief and faith and hope and all that. What are the, what are the epistemic underpinnings of those appeals? Well, just from the very beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? Um, th this, when, when I read this, to me, this is just patently obvious that there is a God. That there is a, the appeal is to, I think, our sensus divinitatis. It's this idea of there is an awareness of God. Um, uh, there is a psalm, I can't not remember exactly which, uh, that talks about the, uh, the, um, how that God's creatorship ought to stir us to adoration. And sometimes that the, ad the adoring God happens even before we understand, like we are worshipers and, and wonders even before we're, we're uh, arguers and, and reasoners. Um, and this is here in Genesis 1, when it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, besides informing our minds about the origin of the cosmos, this account is meant to stir in our hearts worship. Yeah, this is from Psalm 33. Let the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. There's something that happens in our hearts that evokes awe and wonder at all the creation we see around us. What is the epistemic standards? I believe it's just this, this awareness that God has implanted in our hearts that there is a, a creator. Um, we, we talked about this in, in a previous lecture, in the introductory lecture, that God sometimes appeals to his people on the basis of his wrath and judgment. God sends certain signs and miracles, and he says, hey, I've been doing these miracles. I'm going to predict, um, I, I, say, say Cyrus, the, the, the ruler of Cyrus, I'm, I'm going to tell you his name so that when he comes on the scene, you will know that this was me that was speaking, right? That, that's a strong argument from evidence for the identity of, of Jehovah God in the Old Testament. And then, of course, like we talked about, no need to rehash all this, but the miracles of, of that Christ uh, did when he was on the earth. Um, yes, these miracles were meant to indicate that the, the, come, the kingdom was invading this present fallen age and that the curse was being reversed, but they were also meant to stir belief in the hearts of those who were willing to accept it. Um, so all of these, these appeals to belief have an underlying epistemic assumption uh, and it's helpful for us just as an exercise to consider what those might be. So that's all I have for you. I, I know that this is kind of a whirlwind. I've been 
kind of touching into various aspects of epistemology, which is a is a vast topic. But the more you think about it, the more you see how it pervades all of all of life, um, in and how you know that you know what what are the standards uh, for um, for true knowledge. So I think maybe Dr. Arnold, maybe we can kind of uh, segue to some uh, Q and A and and uh, see how how that goes. If we can clarify any concepts, that'd be great. Excellent. Uh, yeah, I have a little building list here, and so I'm happy to just bump through some of these at least. Um, here's one that came up in the chat that I want to make sure we hit, uh, asking here the quote you read from Plantinga about the noetic effects of the fall. Somebody was wondering what the uh, the rep bibliographic information on that was. I was wondering yeah. too. <laughs> yeah, actually, and that would be a great chapter to read. It's from this book, Warranted Christian Belief. Um, this is the one that I said is kind of his I would say his definitive statement of a model of how we can arrive at our understanding the Christian faith. It's uh, chapter seven, sin and its cognitive consequences. And um, if you're curious, it's page 213. I think this is the only edition that's out, so I don't think it matters what year it is. Okay, great. It's not like this hit the New York Times bestseller or anything, you know. Yeah, especially with that cover art. No, that's good. Um, great. Uh, okay, I'll, well, let's start with this because we're just talking about him a second ago. Um, here's a little, <laughs> but we'll see how it goes. Uh, I'm asking this question because, uh, anyway, just we'll see how it goes. Uh, is planting a yes or no? It's not a yes or no. A presuppositionalist. Where do we fit planting a into the rest of our framework? And I mean presuppositionalist, not in the bipolar, there's only two categories. I mean this in Boa and Bowman sense. Don't, don't Boa and Bowman have a reformed yeah. epistemology category? They put them in reformed, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, is, they lump them together. I, I can give an opinion about it, and then if you yeah. want to correct me, how's that? Go, go ahead. Okay, I mean, because but what I'm curious about, and this is where I'd be love, love to get your input. So he's doing some things here with the properly basic beliefs idea and kind of the idea that at the core of the epistemological structure, there is some circularity. And so you chase people back all the way. And at the end of the day, when they're looking at it, you're saying, hey, you have to support your standards with your own standards. So stand up as an apologi apologist, be confident, because you're not really doing by saying, I believe confidently because uh, I hear authoritatively from God's word. You're not doing something fundamentally different from the guy next to you who says, I believe in the standards of logic. Um, so that's kind of an uh, a presuppositionalist move in a way. But in other ways, uh, Plantinga seems to be doing something so fundamentally profoundly different than like a hard boiled, um, a Bonson or a Vantillian kind of presuppositionalism. It seems like a more robust, um, it seems like it's so, because he's willing to step out from that and, and, and go in some other directions and he's willing to engage and he's willing to argue in a way I think that Bonson would be allergic to and say, hey, you're, you're conceding common ground to the unbeliever. Um, how does that sound to you or what do you think? That sounds good. <laughs> yeah, I would say that, that that would be, I. and right off the top of my head, I can't think of all the reasons why I, I feel so strongly about putting him in a different category than, than a presuppositionalist. Um, but, but but yeah, I, I, don't, I think that what he's doing is different than, than a presuppositionalist. I almost, do you think, what do you think of this idea? It almost feels like he's taking some of the best parts. Like there's some insights, there's some real insights that um, Van Til uncovered. And I think that Frame, I like the direction Frame has gone with it better. Um, it's like, what I, I see some things in playing together remind me of that, though I don't know that he's necessarily descending. Maybe he is. Maybe he's connected to that tradition a little bit. But um, it's like he's taking the good insights, but but it's not getting weird. It's not getting like so so specific and so sharpened that you're it's losing its relevance and its connection. Yeah, yeah. I, I think what what he has done, he is primarily engaged in negative apologetics. Uh, it. His um, I think plan. Yeah, his work is primarily in the area of, hey, let's let's rework the rules of the game. Um, let, let's let's not, and, and so he's cleared the way on a very very f foundational level 
He's done some really good work on the problem of evil too. Um, that would be helpful. If you're looking for a, a simple introduction to planting as thought, I would recommend a few chapters on, um, in, in this book by Ronald Nash called Faith and Reason. Uh, because Na what Nash is doing, essentially, I, I think, is these, this is a, a lecture, maybe like a, a course turned book that he taught. And several lectures have to do with planting a, um, so particularly, uh, let me see here. So his, okay, so if you, if you happen to get this book, it's in part two where he talks about the rationality of religious belief. Oh, see, I like to write in my books. Um, uh, so he talks about the evidentialist challenge of religious belief. And then he talks about, he has two chapters on foundationalism. That I think inst before you plunge right into Plantinga, it might be best to understand where planting is going by reading Nash's kind of digest of Plantinga. Uh, in which he talks about because you're you're not gonna in in this uh, in this huge volume by planting a he you you're not gonna read about his defense of well you were a little bit of the problem of evil but um, but Nash does a good job condensing that um, but so to, but to answer your question directly yeah I think that what uh, planting is doing is it's a lot more philosophical. Um, than what the, the uh, presuppositionalists are doing. They tend to be primarily theological. They're talking about, they're insisting on the primacy of the word of God as the only uh, source of, faith, of, of belief. They're insisting on repentance from unbelief. Uh, planting a, is engaging in genuine, uh, detailed, uh, uh, philosophical argument. And I'd, okay. Yeah. Um, let me go to. In so doing, it doesn't feel like he's giving up his theological moorings. I mean, he's maintaining his theological moorings all the same. But like you said, it's doing negative apologetics. So he really is able to engage without just kind of saying, feeling a little bit maybe on, on other in other places strongly presuppositionalist. You can almost feel like it just becomes a you're stupid, no, you're stupid fight. Am I being? Am I overplaying it? Am I overstating that? Or yeah, I, what do you think? Yeah, uh, can you say that again? In it, some it, incarnations of a, a, a hard-boiled presuppositionalism, it can feel a little bit like we're just going to turn unbeliever believer. We're just going to turn into a "you're stupid, no, you're stupid" kind of mm -hmm. fight. Um, hopefully not. Hopefully it doesn't reduce to that. But anyway, it seems like Planting is doing the philosophical thing without giving up his moorings, or without yes. just turning into a philosopher more than a theologian. Yes. yes. What do you think? I, I definitely think so, it, especially as you get further into, so he develops this theory whereby our Christian beliefs can, can have warrant without the sort of justification that tends to be required by a narrow foundationalism. And when he does that, I mean, he is right down the line, all the basics of, you know, a, a, you know, a Chalcedonian Christianity that we would, that we would embrace. Um, so yeah, I don't I don't think he's giving up anything um, there. It, it's uh, so he the, when I say that he's more philosophical and the presuppositionalists are more theological, I don't mean that he is um, that his theology isn't right. I just mean that he gives it a more sturdy philosophical foundation, um, and, and I think a much more robust deal of philosophical argumentation. I mean, you've got some sections in his book where he's using modal logic. Um, and, and, and you just have to skip over those parts because you, you don't understand them. You know, it's just like, oh, okay, maybe like three people in the world will read that with full <laughs> understanding. I'm not one of the three. <laughs> that's encouraging. Okay. <clears throat> and that's helpful even if somebody gets into it and hits that point. Just, okay, we heard it here first. Uh, Dr. Thurl Paul said he skips over that section. So you're allowed to turn those pages and not feel like you, you just tap well, out. I'll, I'll actually tell you, I... You, you can planting a himself will say it because in his book he says there are two kinds of text there's larger text and smaller text and the smaller texts are, are those sections in which you can skip over without losing a whole lot and uh and i skip like he like i'll give you an example like he has he has big text 
little text, big text. This is like really complex argumentation uh, that I've not I've not worked through completely. <laughs> so anyway, fair enough. Um, here's the thing I wanted to ask about foundationalism. So you said foundationalism is the most co has been the most common in the Western tradition, or has been you know, profoundly influential. Um, yeah. And two questions I had follow up, or do you want to qualify that first? Go, go Did ahead. I summarize you? Okay. Two things. Um, one is, I'm kind of curious why. Is it like from a historical standpoint? Are we? I know that like Euclidean geometry has played this this huge outsized role in particularly like the rationalist tradition. But anyway, I mean, yeah, is, is that why, is there any historical reason? And then the follow-up question, I'll tell you now, just so you know where I'm going and I can come back to it, but is foundationalism a category that's giving away, giving way a little bit? Is, it, is that foundation of foundationalism starting to shake a little bit in current discourse? Um, is that gonna have less of a, a role in the Western tradition? Okay, so the first question is why why was foundationalism so influential? Why was it the reigning model of epistemology? Um, boy, I, I can't tell you right off the top of my head. Um, I think I think part of, I, I don't know if this actually answers the question, but part of it goes to our, our just craving to, to know absolutely, mathematically, to be certain about something if you kind of go back to Descartes' project of thinking that he can derive a system of morality and philosophy that's as watertight as Euclidean geometry, and he actually aspired that it would not be so much that philosophers would get together and argue back and forth, but they'd get out their papers and pencils and do basically that the equivalent of mathematical equations come, oh, okay, now we can all agree that such and such is wrong and such and such is right and that we should live this way it is as if it's as easy as doing a working out a math problem now like an early positivism or something right right we crave for that kind of certainty and i think perhaps one reason at, at that point in history why they crave for that sort of certainty is because europe was disintegrating after the reformation you had all these different ideas it, the the um the, the ruling dominance of the roman catholic church was was not there anymore you have it, it europe was in a state of turbulence at that point and i think that would explain descartes uh desire to just have something that we can um grab a hold of and know and know with certainty so i believe this because i know this because i know this because i know this because two plus two plus four you know that kind of, <laughs> that kind of uh logic um that's my best shot at it but i i don't know what do you think of this idea? Do you think, do you think this makes any sense? So the foundationalism thing, and then we realize like narrow foundationalism, it's not really working out all that. But is it is it something sort of like this, like in some way, knowledge does seem to line up that way. But the truth is the, the wall, <laughs> the distance between the top of the wall and the actual foundation is so far that we're like, yeah, I went down 10 blocks, I must be almost there. And we're actually talking about like 100 miles. Um, kind of like a, uh, I think uh, in the Albert Einstein biography I went through recently, he's working through, through these equations and he's trying to be, bring together the equations for relativity and quantum. And he's like, okay, I'm almost there. I've almost found the connection point. And he works his whole life and he never gets there. And like 50 years later, we still haven't gotten there. And what you realize is they kind of thought the equations were merging. It was almost here. And it's like, no, just kidding. They're actually really, really far apart. And you've only moved like an inch towards your goal and you've got 50 miles to go. Um, is that kind of, is that a, a valid, valid way maybe to think about this? Um, kind of what's going on here, why this isn't working out for us? I, I wonder if the whole assumption that we can ground our beliefs so neatly, I wonder if that whole assumption is flawed itself. So take, take my belief that my wife loves me. Well, I believe that because she told me. Well, how do you know that what she says is, is trustworthy? Well, because most people that have told me things that have treated me in such and such a way have been true. Uh, you know, so let's say I keep on going down and down and down and trying to figure out all these reasons. It's almost like I assume that I'm a computer. I'm almost assuming it's an assumption about, about what a human being is. When in fact, that's not really the way I reason. That's not really the, what we are. We're, we're not just, we're not just computers who, who plug, plug in a series of, of, of facts and figures and come out with a, a conclusion. 
our beliefs are formed in a much richer way. That's where I think, and I'm going to broaden out just a little bit. That's where I, I think there's a lot of merit in this thing of virtue epistemology, where the kinds of things that you believe is not so much the process that you arrive to, but it's the kind of person that you are. I think there is a huge connection between that and the role of the Holy Spirit in convincing a person that he's a sinner. So now he becomes he comes to believe a set of propositions that he could not believe as an unbeliever. Why? Because he's, he's, he's changed as a person. So now his ability to arrive at certain truths has, has he, he believes differently, not because he he acquired more information, not because he discovered a certain more robust process of arriving at certain beliefs, but because he was changed as a person. His essentially uh, he adopted new virtues. Oh, thank you, Krista. She does love me. <laughs> um, That's a good comment. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, Dr. Tharpal's wife jumped on and said, I do, I do. So that settles it. She loves you. We're done. Yeah. Uh, so in other words, I think, I think Dr. Arnold, what, you, what you're asking there is very pertinent, but I would, um, you know, how far away this belief right here, how far away is this really from the foundation according to the foundationalist view? Well, I think that's one reason why, like, we're going to have to put the foundationalist uh, model of knowledge aside. It doesn't seem to be working very well. We're, we're, as humans, we're far more complex than that. Um, so, yeah, we, we have to, so this whole idea of arriving at different conclusions based on what kind of person we are, I think accounts for the human side. That, that's why I, I'm going to read this um, definition that uh, Plantinga gave for uh, belief being warranted. And if you listen carefully to this definition, you'll hear different processes, epist epistemic processes at work here. You'll hear, hear, you'll hear virtue epistemology, the kind of person you are. You'll hear reliabilism. You'll hear coherentism. But listen to this. He says, a belief is warranted if, one, the cognitive faculties involved in the production of your belief are functioning properly. So there's got to be a process in, in your mind that's going on. Number two, your cognitive environment is sufficiently similar uh, to the one for which your cognitive faculties are designed. Uh, that would be a strike against naturalism, which says um, that we evolved from lower life forms and everything that's going on in our minds right now are a result of a sequential uh, chain reaction of evolution. Well, if that's the case, then how can you say that, how do you know that if your mind is just the product of cause and effects going back to whenever time? Uh, number three, the design plan governing the production of belief in question involves the production of true beliefs um, and the design plan is a good one that is there are, there is a high statistic or objective probability that the a belief produced in accordance with the that a belief produced in accordance with the relevant segment of the design plan in that sort of environment is true typical planting a you can't really understand what he's saying until you think about it for a really long time but what he's saying is that what it takes to come at true at knowledge is a person whose mind is working right and whose environment is right, and the process at which you arrived at that belief is right. Um, so, yeah, the foundationalist, and then I think this answers, I think, two questions back. The whole foundationalist model of of knowledge, I think it definitely is shaking and cracking, and it doesn't, because we realize it doesn't really work. And um, Scott jumped on here and asked here, I know, I know we'll get to postmodernism later, but is that part of this? Has postmodernism affected our approach to epistemology? Definitely, definitely. So how or how would we connect with these ideas? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, instead of a, like postmodernism, for instance, would say, um, okay, so foundationalism would say that a statement is true because it can be linked through a causal uh, process to a basic belief. Postmodernism would, would say, uh, well, it's true because my community, uh, th this story helps shape my my uh, my community, um, or this this story helps me navigate life, or um, because the power structures at play in my life have fed me this narrative. Um, so, yeah, this would be um, yeah. I, I just began thinking about postmodernism as as uh, we started talking about the demise of foundationalism. And I mean, there's something that's so weird to me about postmodernism, even though we, so these kind, this kind of structure, and yet I, I always wonder sometimes, are we, 
it's like we can't shake the foundationalism that is still there. Like, so even within that conversation or something, somebody will start out and go in a postmodernist direction. Kind of, this kind of sounds like our lecture last time. They'll start in a postmodernist direction, but then they'll swerve back into something that sounds really profoundly modernist, actually it is. And we're just, we, we kind of swerve. It's, it's like, it's very hard to actually find somebody who's a truly committed postmodern um, and who actually keeps up with it and does it all the time. Does that sound right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because I, I think the issue is um, our, our, our theories of knowledge, our, our, our epistemology, um, they tend to be insufficient to account for the real way that we as humans believe. And so when we try to adopt one, then it ends up being deformed in a certain way. And then so we swing into a different direction, which ends up being deformed in a certain a different way. Um, and I don't think we'll ever, because we're so complex and created in the image of God, I don't think that we'll ever really understand, ever be able to come up with a watertight theory for how we arrive at true beliefs, at, at true knowledge. It's so, I mean, it's so like, this is philosophy for you, but it's, 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 it's so galling and so crazy that at the end of the day and after all the discussion, we can't actually solve this problem, even though we know that we're knowers. And even though that we have this discussion, and even though it's possible for two guys to sit down and talk, one guy to make an argument, the other guy to go, oh yeah, yeah, okay, I was wrong, that makes sense. Something just happened here and words went out and it made the other guy concede his point, but we cannot account for that. It's, it's just so weird, <laughs> mind blowing. Um, awesome. Uh, you talk, uh, oh, comment here, virtue ethics. I, I like that a lot in the sense of, like, is this a, getting the idea of virtue ethics? You know, if you've ever known somebody and he just had really good judgment. And so, like, when that guy spoke and he said, you know, if this happens, then I can tell you what the next step, it's going to be this. And that guy spoke, you were like, yeah, I've known this guy the last 15 times he made this, product, this prediction. He just... He just nails it every time um, versus knowing somebody who like th is constantly throwing out these kind of nutty opinions or perspectives. And after a, a certain time, you just don't really trust that guy's judgment so much. Um, and so the idea of virtue ethics is developing as a person in such a way, basically you're forming up your judgment, you're forming up your standards in a way that, that by virtue of who you are, you end up falling into patterns of right thinking. Is that, is that it? expression of virtue ethics or how would you sharpen my definition yeah um i would say virtue ethics means that the probability of your arriving at a justified true belief a, a true knowledge is increased in proportional in proportion to the uh, quality of your virtues um so if you i'll give you some examples if you, uh, this is what Plantinga said, if you are a proud person, uh, which is a vice, then you are going to tend to believe that the universe revolves around you. Not, not in those words exactly, but you will assume that a person's glance your direction was a cynical, critical gaze, right? And, and when in fact that person just happened to look that way, you're like, what are you looking at me for? Like, like, or, or you'll assume, but let's put it this way. This is, a, there's a brilliant example of this in The Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky, in which Father Zosima is, ex is talking about his history. And he says that he was a young man, a dashing officer that was visiting a town and he thought this girl was in love with him. And he, was, he had another assignment. He went off for a few months. He was gonna come back and propose to her. When he came back, he, he realized that she was already married and that she had been engaged while he was away. But he was so full of himself that he, all he could think about was how handsome he was and just assumed that she was in love with him. And so didn't even see that she was engaged, didn't even see that she actually liked this other guy. Th there's, a, there's a perfect example of virtue epistemology. His pride actually kept him from arriving at the truth. And you see how that works on a number of levels. Pride is a vice, humility is a virtue. The, hum the humbler you are, the better chance you have of believing true propositions, of, of having true knowledge. Isn't it interesting how it's something we would not normally connect humility, but the ability to arrive at, at, at um, knowledge, are, are, they're intimately connected. Another example would be, um, would be laziness and, and versus studiousness. Uh, like, I don't, I don't want to bother to find out the truth about this. That, that connection is a little more clear. Um, but we tend not to think of lazy people 
well, yeah, yeah. So lazy people tend to be ignorant people. Why? Because they're not in, interested in finding out the truth. Uh, even this, that there's something called vicious curiosity, which is where it, it's like the, the pendulum swing of studiousness. Now, studiousness would be the virtue. Vicious curiosity would be its opposite vice, where you, you just like have this incessant desire to know things and, and you want to like kind of snoop on people, eavesdrop, uh, you know, spy on people. Well, be, the, the kinds of information that you are going to gather about those people are, are going to skew your view of reality. And because your, your, your studiousness has warped into vicious curiosity. And so as you, as you begin to see these things, you realize actually these virtues are very pertinent to epistemology. My ability to arrive at the truth depends a great deal on what kind of person I am. So this, um, th this actually, a lot of this is derived from Jay Wood's book on, on uh, it's called Epistemology Becoming Intellectually Virtuous. Um, he talks about Alvin Plantinga in this book too. Um, but I would, I would recommend this as a good introduction to epistemology. Alvin Plantinga, I mean, he's just, everyone talks about him. Even John Calvin talks about Alvin Plantinga. <laughs> Plantinga is born until four. I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> but so, yeah, that would be, um, that would be the, the connection between virtues and epistemology. Um, your comment about if it's say pride affects you as a thinker. I, uh, one of the thoughts that goes, pops in my mind, and we'll have a future class sort of really on missiology, but kind of that same similar idea, some of the core qualities to navigating culture change or navigating missiology, missiological problems come down to fruits of the spirit. You know, I mean, if you're, if you're thinking about other people, if you're flexible, if you're humble, if you doubt yourself, those, all, those things go really far to helping you counter ethnocentrism. Um, so yeah, that's good. It's a great thought. Um, okay, this goes back to you talked about noet the noetic effects of the fall. Uh, just a comment here. Um, Bonson, who we've met in represent in, in respect to uh, presuppositionalism, my understanding I've not read it, but his dissertation was on self deception, which is a just an utterly crazy idea. But it's it's true that a person can actually know that what they're thinking or the belief that they've come to is not right, and yet they want it to be right so much that they will actually deceive themselves, which we get, you know, person A deceives person B. But when person A and person B are the same person, how uh, deception depends on an asymmetry of information. This person knows something, this person doesn't, so I don't tell you what's actually going on. How do you pull that into one head? In one head, I'm lying to myself, and so, like, what is there, a part of my head that doesn't know what the other part of my head is? It doesn't even make sense. But I mean, demonstrating demonstrably this is real. Um, and that concept really lines up quite effectively with Romans 1 and, and the way that scripture will talk about suppression, right? Suppressing the truth. Um, any comments there or follow-ups there? Um, well, I would say that self-deception is definitely pertinent to the topic of epistemology. Um, it's it's a huge issue in epistemology. In fact, if you just Google self-deception epistemology, you'll, you'll come up with a lot of interesting discussion. Um, but I, I would say, like, it, it seems um, absurd that anyone can convince themselves of something that they believe to be false. I think one thing that's important to know is that this happens over time. And so there's a process to this. Like, at some point, I begin, I believe this, and then I start wishing it weren't true. So I investigate some more information that would hold to my desired belief and then begin to forget more, like deliberately forget this information, but pile up more evidence over here and then deliberately forget this. And pretty much, again, we're, we're uh, as knowers, we're whole people. And I begin to focus on all the evidence that, that I think supports my belief, which at one point I knew to be false. Um, and yeah, that, that definitely happens all the time. And I think that's, as uh, fallen people, we are, we come into the world as we, as our minds develop, deceiving ourselves about who God is and who we are um, until, until God just demolishes that self-deception by showing us the truth of the gospel. Fabulous. Um, I'm going to, probably just the last thing we have time to do. Um, Okay, so there's like the there's the there are the traditional uh, arguments, and then you can do that with other evidences and stuff like that. What what about this? What about this way of viewing the use, particularly of the like the five traditional arguments for the existence of God? But I don't care. Even like uh, historical arguments from the from the resurrection and so forth. What about viewing these as primarily 
negative in the sense that um, as a believer, I don't really derive my final confidence from these things. It's, it's not like this is what I'm hanging on to that makes me believe when I die someday, I will be in the arms of Jesus. This is not really going to do it for me there. Um, but they work great as arguments attacking other views. And the reason I, I'm okay with using them is because I think I can attach each one of them to scripture in places. Like I can find scripture doing some similar things. Um, so they don't necessarily like support in a way of giving me ultimate confidence to my own faith, but they almost, they do attack or they poke holes in other views. And then as far as me as a believer, my ultimate confidence goes, I, I like a second Peter one idea, the person who's um, not increasing in these things has forgotten that he was purged from his past sins. So my ultimate confidence really is going to come down to my walking with God. Um, and if my, my walk is right, then basic things start kicking in like, you know, how do I know that a God exists if, if I'm talking to him regularly, if I know him, if I'm fellowshipping with him, this is not hard. Um, but then these other arguments basically become like bumpers, if I'm thinking like the bumpers on the side of a bowling alley, where if I start to get off, they at least reveal to me that I'm getting stupider um, by, by a, uh, ignoring what's obvious and so they kind of bump me back into the reality but the reality ultimately is going to be something more 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 robust deeper personal um how would you engage with that kind of idea um yeah i i think that's i think that's good um i, I yeah i would say that um yeah I, yeah i i would agree with that i think that's helpful um it's kind of like a brush pile of a whole bunch of anyway. yeah yeah no that that's yeah that's good i think um yeah yeah i like it throw a match in there and you have a dumpster fire um okay well uh if anybody if you have any other closing comments out here we'll close out the lecture anything else you wanted to add or just finish this out with you this this is very helpful i've got I don't know, it looks like about six pages worth of notes. Um, very helpful stuff. But anything that we you want to just leave us with? Um, I, you know, I think that I directed you to, to some helpful books. I, I think maybe the most helpful as a starting point would probably be this one by um, Jay Wood, um, because it's, it's an easy read. It's easier than, and it's very practical. But he does hit on some of the things that we've talked about. Um, and then I, I think just raising your awareness of epistemology in every day, it just, if you start thinking, okay, upon what basis, like you read the news, like, how do, how do I know this? Um, what, what am I, what, what is my role? Think, think about yourself as an, act, as an active knower, as someone whose belief, believing is not something that happens to you passively, but something that you, you actively em embrace. And uh, that can help inform your own um, uh, choice to believe certain things and it can just sharpen you as an apologist as well I'm just thinking about that don't you think we uh, it's that pride again that keeps us from doubting ourselves that we don't do this so no. so we come full circle and if we were if we were if we were doubting ourselves as knowers uh, based many times on the word of God correcting us then we would be more self-conscious of this yeah 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 that's good Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Um, I'm kind of sad that we're not going to see you again but in this course. But um, anyway, very much grateful for your time. Thank you for giving us two great lectures and then all during this time that you were uh, traveling to, uh, what was it, Vermont, Nova Scotia, California, <laughs> wherever you are. Um, so excellent. Thank you very much. Thank and you. All others, we will see you all on Thursday. We'll be with uh, Dr. Mike Riley then. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you again. We'll see you all. Have a great day.